Hey guys, welcome to another Rails-based tutorial. This is more or less just a configuration-based how-to. Nothing crazy here, but if you've come to Rails like I have in the past, my first experience with the framework, I was overwhelmed with the CLI that's built in. And it's basically because you can scaffold anything you want or configure anything you want, which way you want, based around this CLI. And if you don't know what CLI is, that is a command line interface. and what that can do is create a new app or configure an app when you do create a new Rails app to do pretty much what you want out of the box. And that's the beauty of the framework itself. So by default, Rails ships with a lot of things like Action Mailer, Active uh, Record, of course, um, Active Storage, all those things come stock. Um, you can prefer to skip that, even things as much as like your server. So Puma now ships with 5.2. Um, on Rails, so that's something that's a default now. But you can choose to skip that and maybe use another service like Passenger or something like that uh, for your actual server. Amongst that, you can skip things like uh, the Git installation if you don't want to deal with Git at this time, or even configure your database on the fly. So a lot of times, your production app would probably not use SQL Lite, which is the default for a new Rails app. So uh, I could give you some perspective here, but just running Rails in your command line and you'll see all these flags come back that allow uh, you to really configure on the fly, which is awesome. So if you're new to Rails, this might be um, something completely new to you and foreign to you. If you've been using it, you've already know this maybe already, but some of these things are fresh to me, even though I've been using this framework for a while now. So like the ability to skip um, active storage, you can run um, configure JavaScript. So say you don't want the default coffee script Rails ships with, for some reason they prefer that. I like JavaScript to be vanilla on my end, so I just go ahead and skip coffee usually by default. Um, this is something you can pass when you run your Rails new app, so that's kind of nice. And from there you can you know configure what you want. So your database, for instance, I'd probably use Postgres for a production ready app. Um, that's that's kind of my default. That's what Heroku uses and prefers. The same with Hatchbox, which is what I host my apps on now. Definitely check out that service if you haven't. And same with uh, front-end frameworks. So you can Webpack by default can come with Rails now. So great thing there is you can pass in a flag Webpack and then choose which framework you actually want to install. So say you want Vue or Stimulus or React, whatever you prefer. You can go ahead and pass those through. The same is true again for APIs. So maybe we'll do just a basic demo of an app here and I'll configure it the way I'd prefer. So we'll do like a Rails new, I don't know, demo CLI. Then we'll pass a few flags. So what I'm gonna do is skip coffee. I don't want coffee script. Uh, for now, I'll skip test, which is a dash T. You can do that just by writing that or you can Past the whole thing. Uh, obviously tests are important um, for this stuff. I don't focus a lot on tests because I want to at least teach the framework first before you start testing things. Ideally in a perfect world, uh, you confide to test-driven development, which is like the opposite. So that stands for TDD and you would actually test first and then build the feature. So it's kind of a whole backwards algorithm to think about but it ends up being a more fail-safe solution in the long run. And it's how we do things day-to-day -day at Dribbble too. So interesting stuff behind the scenes there. So I'll skip T for now. Um, I'm gonna configure Webpack to say use Vue.js. And we could say, uh, I think Vue. These keywords here are your options you can pass. And then what I'll do is make it an API. You don't want to skip API, but you can actually pass in API um, to actually have it be an API based app. So uh, upcoming tutorial series I'm going to work on is an API based app. So we'll actually have a server side um, Rails app that we'll talk to with a front end framework. So we'll have actually two apps that will be communicating um, in that way. So the Rails side is saving the data and, and spitting out the data and the front end framework is absorbing it, modifying it and, and pushing it up or deleting it, whichever which way you would like to do it. So I think this will work. Um, I haven't tried this yet. This is kind of an on the fly video, but I wanted to just give you some insight of what you can do and how much you can configure with this app. Uh, one thing I wanna do is do a database 
of you could just pass a space after this and then we'll do postgres ql i think it's 1s double check yeah postgres ql so let's try that and see what happens there we go fetches some gems we need so an api based app is going to strip out a lot of the fluff we don't need uh, you see it's running Webpacker and Forest as well and setting it to uh, all the defaults it needs. And then we're going to get Vue.js, of course, too, which is cool. So let's make sure that works. So Node SAS takes forever to install, so sorry if this takes forever. There we go. View is coming in. CD into that app. So CD, what did I call it? Demo CLI. Oh gosh. CD demo. Cool. And then I'll just open it sublime for now. I might have another app already been working on. Quite a few actually. So our configuration here is going to be based on an API stuff. So you won't see some of the stuff we need more so for server side rendering. So that's kind of neat for the sake of uh, what we'll use. But we do have our app JavaScript folder, which is gonna be based around Vue, which you see here, which is cool. Um, our basic application script and our default component for Vue.js. So more on this will come. Um, I feel like Vue is probably the, the route I'll head for a lot of um, front end based stuff that I'll use with two apps talking to each other. But there is stimulus, which is kind of a more drop in solution for just basic stuff. Like say you need a tab component or a drop down component, you can configure that in Vue and you don't need anything or in uh, stimulus and you don't need anything fancy outside of that. Vue is more in depth, so you, you would need more things. So that's kind of the route I would probably head. React is kind of one of those frameworks where you need to just basically be all React or nothing. So it's kind of scary in my opinion, but you know, to each his own. Aside from that, this sets it up for the API based stuff. So here, here's a flag to set that API only. So when you run a new uh, resource or something like that, just generate a new model, I don't know, maybe Rails new generate model post something like that and we'll say name is tech or string text or let's say body is text. This is basic stuff right here and nothing I'm gonna use. In fact, why don't I do a scaffold of that? So a cool thing here, you can do Rails destroy model post and it'll backtrack everything you just did there. So, so that's some more CLI magic that I love. If I happen to run a, a generator wrong, that's I love that so much. So let's try uh, Rails generate scaffold. And of course, everyone has their thoughts about scaffolding. So let's say, uh, let's just say post. And we'll pass in a title, will be a string, and the body will be text, something basic. All right, so that's all we get generated. You notice there's no view files, nothing. It's just a basic uh, controller, so that's pretty sweet. So with that, I've already got this open. We can go and check out our model and see what it's doing. We just have a basic model like normal. Our controller is the same. Uh, we still have our actions on it, but you notice it renders JSON instead of our traditional views or HTML responses. So We've got only JSON to work with, which is great for the server side aspect. We only need that to deal with on the front end, which is a bit like perfect for a front end framework to deal with, uh, like Vue. So we don't really even have an application layout. So when you go to these routes in your configuration or in your routes, um, you get resources posts. And we still get our, our CRUD kind of model, but we have it on the API instance now. So that's kind of nice. And I'm going too deep into this. I'll get into more detail later on when we actually build an actual API, uh, like namespace. So we'll have like a V1 API and then you can add another a V2. That's kind of a common practice of APIs. So aside from that, we've got um, all that stuff you know, taken care of. Our migrations here. Uh, nothing really crazy there. Um, we can just actually run that since our database should be set up. I already have um, Postgres running. We can double check that the database is set up. Yeah, we've got, 
when you pass that flag of, of Postgres, it does this file differently. So you've got um, whatever you need here, but you can install, you'll notice in the gem file, we're gonna have a PG gem instead of SQLite. And that's what's taking place there. So all that is on the fly and it's well worth doing that from the start. So you don't have to do this by hand, which can get kind of uh, finicky. But you see, we get a production-based database uh, on the production instance. Same for tests when you run tests and then another development-based one. So you, typically with each app, you have three databases. Um, and, and if you have a staging environment, you'd add another one. So it's kind of a common thing. So this might be a lot to take in, um, but that is the basis of running a new app with all those different flags. You can configure it to do well whatever you want. Um, I'll run that again just to show you the context of here. So when you run Rails, you can have all these things at your arsenal. And once you actually are in the app, you get these actual different things you can run. So you could say Rails about, for instance, we'll give you some details about your app. Here we go. So we got uh, version 5.2.2, Ruby 2.5.3 with the patch of 105, um, all these other things underlying the hood, the path to the actual root and the database. So that's really cool stuff to know if you're already coming to an app, maybe you just, um, you know, discovered it. I'm gonna see what Rails Notes is. I don't even know what this is. Nothing, okay, cool. So <laughs> let's try that again. I just want to see what else we have. So Rails stats is kind of useful. Kind of gives you a basis of what's going on in your um, app and maybe some speed and all, all these kind of code um, stats that kind of give you, an, um, I don't know, some basis of how big your app is getting and maybe you should configure it better or something like that. So. Very cool stuff. Um, again, this framework's so feature rich that you could spend days just kind of uncovering new features left and right. I still am learning. Um, I'm using YouTube, honestly, as my source for learning uh, live. So, or I guess recorded. But hopefully you guys, you, you benefit from it. I, if I can be of any help, please leave some comments. I'm happy to reply to them. I usually see every which one you, you leave. So don't be shy. So with that, I think I'll leave that as is. The next coming Let's Build, I did an actual poll on my channel and everyone wanted to see an API-based app. So that's what I'm gonna do next. It is time consuming, so be, please be patient, um, but I'm planning on getting that going shortly. This time of year is like hell on earth for me, so I'm trying to get all my time um, where I can because I have um, the day job, it's the holiday season, um, I have a newborn, well, he's not newborn, but he's like nine months old. That's not newborn. But anyway, he takes up my time. So I have to be a parent and do all this too. So like I said, bear with me. I appreciate your support so far. And I will see you in the next video. Peace.